Whether the team is giving us the highest of highs or the bluest of blues, we'll cover it all here on Command Nightly News. I, of course, am your host, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. Let's get to tonight's lead story. So the Chase Young watch may be coming to a merciful end. Sunday versus the Giants may be the debut of Chase Young in 2022. Now, we've said this before, and it has not happened. But last week was a week in which Ron Rivera and company were very giddy on Friday after practice. The plan was to play Chase Young, barring a setback. And then, of course, he got ill on Saturday and was not able to play on Sunday. You fast forward to this week. Same thing that was said about Chase Young on Friday last week was said this Friday, which is another strong day of practice. Feel really good. We will reevaluate him on Sunday and make a decision as to whether he will play then. So he is truly a game time decision. Chase Young watch has been long. It has been drawn out. I think a lot of the fans at this point are sick and tired and maybe even fatigued by Chase Young watch. I think Chase Young himself is mentally fatigued by this. I talked to, I talked to you guys about um, his presser at his locker room last week. Um, or at his locker, rather, in the locker room last week and how he was very short with the media and he was short because he said, I'm, I'm sick and tired of talking about it personally. I just, I'm ready to get back on the field. So everybody, I think, is at the point where they're fatigued and they're just ready for him to get back on the field. I'm tired of people telling us how much he's going to add to the defense. We don't know what he's going to add to the defense. We don't know what he's going to bring to the table. We don't know what to expect from Chase Young when he comes back. He's only going to be playing a minimal amount of snaps. We don't know what exactly he's going to, you know, what capacity he's going to be at. Mentally, I think it's more of the, the bigger issue than physically. I mean, he, I think his knee is going to be structurally intact. But mentally, is he telling himself, I can do all the things that I'm accustomed to doing? I don't think you're going to get that right out of the gate, okay? That's more of what you deal with when you get injured is the mental side of things. Physically, his knee is fine. Mentally, he's got to tell himself that his knee is fine and I can do all the things that I could do prior to the injury. And that's going to take a while. So I don't really know what to expect from him. At the end of the day, I just want him back on the football field. I think this team in, in defense specifically is better with Chase Young on the field than without him. So uh, I'm hoping that this is the week against the Giants that he's finally back. Ron said it, it, they'll make a decision on Sunday. They're going to work him out prior to the game if he feels good, not just physically, but mentally, I think, is the part, that hurdle, that last hurdle that he has to clear. Mentally, if he feels good, I think he's going to make his debut this Sunday. But we will see. Hopefully, this thing is over. For some of you, you're like, I don't really give a shit. I don't care. I stopped caring a while ago when we were yo-yoing back and forth. I mean, we've been really on Chase Young watch. Think about it. This is like week seven, okay? When, when Green Bay came to town... I think we started thinking maybe he could play against the Packers. Then it wasn't the Packers. Well, maybe he could play against the Colts on the road in week eight. Didn't happen. I circled week nine against the Vikings. That didn't happen. Then I said, oh, he's definitely playing on Monday night versus the Eagles. That didn't happen. I didn't think he was going to play against the Texans in week 11. But week 12, I said, he's definitely going to play. And he would have. I really strongly believe that. Had he not gotten sick, he would have played last week. I think this is the week, barring any kind of setback or any kind of unforeseen circumstance. I think Chase Young uh, plays this week, makes his debut, and Chase Young watch can officially come to a bitter and very, <laughs> very um, anticipated end. Okay, we'll see. In other news, um, I want to give a shout out to my guy, Joe Rockhead J. Now, um, th this is something that happens quite often with um, viewers of the show. Uh, I get sent things on socials all the time. And I appreciate each and every single one of you for sending me things because I don't see everything. Okay. You know, I'm not a big social media guy, so I don't see everything. A lot of times when guys are celebrating on IG and they go live, I don't see it. Unless you guys bring it to my doorstep, I'm not aware. So I truly do appreciate you guys bringing me every tidbit of Washington Commanders information or anything that you think might be interesting. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate you guys shooting your shot. That said, a lot of times though, probably 75, 80% of the time, I have seen it. And a lot of you start off when you send it saying, hey, I'm pretty sure you've seen this, but I just thought I'd send this to you. 
Well, uh, Joe Rockhead J sent me a link to a Ron Rivera interview with the 33rd team, which is a play on the NFL. It's an NFL publication um, that covers the league. 33rd team, you get it, 32 teams in the league. They call themselves the 33rd team. Anyway, it's made up of a bunch of ex-coaches and players and things of that nature. And I think if you really want a candid interview with a player, a current player or a current coach, it's best if you have a former coach or player interview them. It, because there, it's a sacred brotherhood and you're willing to let your guard down when you're talking to someone that you trust or that you feel like can relate to what you've been through. So a lot of times you get real candid interviews and answers from guys when they're speaking to fellow players or guys who have played or coaches who are coaching or who have coached. That said, I mean, and, and look, look at all the podcasts that have sprung up here, you know, The Pivot and, and, the, and the Brandon Marshall, you know, ensemble and things of that nature. Uh, bussing with the boys and you, you've seen all these different things uh, you know kind of spawned over the last year or two and they've been wildly successful why because it's players talking to players it's players talking to coaches ex-coaches talking to players things of that nature anyway I said all of that to say this Dave Wanstead did the interview with Ron Rivera all right it's 10 minutes long so if you've got 10 minutes um, it's a really good watch I'm going to leave the link down in the description of this video. I will pin it to the top of the comment section so you won't have to go far searching for it. You've probably already seen it, but if you haven't, again, 10 minutes is all you need to check this out. Um, Ron is very candid on a number of different topics, including the offense and what this thing was supposed to be and, and, and what it's morphed into, um, You know, keeping the team focused despite some of the distractions off the field, i.e. Daniel Snyder potentially selling the team. And so he gets into a number of different things, um, and I think it's worth your time. So check that out uh, if you get an opportunity. And again, shout out to Joe Rockhead J for sending that to me because I had not been privy to that interview prior to him sending it to me. So um, let's get to Week 13's injury report for both teams, the final one for Week 13. And we start with the good guys. Um, no surprises here. Everything that we thought was going to transpire – has transpired. Dax Milne, Benjamin St. Juice, Trey Turner all out for the game on Sunday versus the New York Giants. The hope is Milne, St. Juice, and Trey Turner will all be ready to go post by. We'll see how severe their injuries are, hoping that at a bare minimum, Juice is ready post by. But the Trey Turner injury, we talked about this already, very interesting because of what it could potentially unearth. We're going to see Sam Cosme make his NFL debut at right guard, okay? We're going to see him make his debut at guard, rather, okay? He's been a tackle. He's, all of his starts, all of his playing time, for the most part, has come at tackle. So this will be the first time he started an NFL game at guard. And right now he's got a, um, you know, and again, I'm not a PFF guy, but uh, they've rated him uh, fairly high in the run blocking department. Same thing last year when he played. And so... Uh, the, the thought process is he's going to help this team in the run game. And who knows what we may unearth here. You know, on accident, we may have found our Brandon Sheriff replacement. You know, Scott Turner talked about putting your best five offensive linemen on the field. You may be doing that here, inserting Sam Cosme. And he may give this team an even bigger boost at the guard position. We'll see. Continuity is everything. You're losing a guy that has been playing the last month or so and actually playing well in Trey Turner. So uh, we'll see if Cosme can be inserted, come in, and, and this offensive line not miss a beat. But um, we may have found an answer at guard. And if you do have an answer at guard, that means you're going to have to draft another tackle and potentially another guard, um, especially if you don't bring Wes Schweitzer back. That's another conversation for another day. Uh, we'll see what Sam Cosme being inserted into the offensive line does for that group up front. Gibson and his foot was limited Wednesday, then didn't practice, which I think spooked a lot of us. He did practice today and is trending towards playing. He's listed as questionable. Same with Chase Young. Both are questionable. The two guys um, after Gibson, Tyler Larson and, and Logan Thomas, both 
are going to play and will be active on Sunday. So, And I, there was never a doubt with either one of those guys. Both of them are tough guys, and they've shown the ability to play through injuries. They just got to last one more week, and then they get a full week off to lick their wounds and hopefully be ready for the stretch run. But Gibson is trending towards playing. Again, he's a tough guy as well, and I really expected him to play, which is why Thursday's DMP kind of spooked me a bit. But uh, all reports where he practiced Friday looked good, and he's trending towards playing on Sunday. So um, that's the Washington injury report. Now we go to the New York Giants. So um, the three guys that we said were going to be out are out. Josh Izudu, uh, um, rookie offensive lineman out of North Carolina. Uh, starting corner, Adoree Jackson is out. And Shane Lemieux, um, offensive lineman, interior offensive lineman with the toe. So those three guys are out. All right. Now you go to the questionable, and there were a lot of questionable guys, and I told you most of those guys are going to play. Like, let's be honest with each other. Uh, Daniel Bellinger, their, their leading touchdown uh, maker at the tight end position, um, probably going to play. Dane Belton, safety, probably going to play. Gary Brightwell, backup running back, probably going to play. Carter Coughlin, edge rusher, probably going to play. John Feliciano, offensive lineman, probably going to play. Darnay Holmes, slot corner, you know, kind of uh, Swiss Army knife in the secondary, probably going to play. Richie James. Second leading receiver on the team and their punt returner. Probably going to play. Fabian Moreau, uh, their other starting corner opposite of Adore Jackson. Probably going to play. Darius Slayton, that's a question mark. He got sick on Thursday. And so I don't know if he's going to play or not with that illness. It just depends on the severity of it. Uh, my guess is he's going to play. But we will see. Uh, and the Giants look like they're going to bring back. We're trying to bring back Chase Young and have him make his debut for 2022 this season against the Giants. Uh, the Giants are getting their star pass rusher back potentially in this game, Aziz Ojolari, who has been on IR. Uh, he looks like he's going to make his return against Washington in this game. So um, they may be getting a huge boost there. So um, th th again, the Giants are going to come out guns a blazing. Their season isn't on the line. But it's trending in the wrong direction, and another loss could send them spiraling out of control, and they may not be able to reel it back in. So this is a big one. They're, all hands are going to be on deck for the Giants in this game, and that's what makes them very, very dangerous. But uh, we, we transition right into the game plan for this game. And I talked on, uh, about a number of different topics, you know, leading into this thing behind enemy lines, things of that nature. Um, I just quickly want to go over some things that have piqued my interest with this Giants team. And I want to start on the offensive side of the football for Washington. This is a game in which obviously Washington has been, you know, ball control. We lead the league in time of possession. Uh, we've been close to the vest, you know, running the football on first and second downs a lot of times and, and setting ourselves up to be third and manageable. We're going to have to continue to do the things that we've done during this stretch, specifically the last three weeks in particular, which is keep the penalties down. Uh, that's been huge against Philadelphia, Houston, and, and last week only four penalties against the Atlanta Falcons. You want to keep it at a bare minimum uh, because, again, we are not a team that is capable consistently of overcoming long downs and distances. We are a stay ahead of the chains type of offense, get three on first down, get four on second down, third and three, convert, do it again rinse wash you know wash rinse repeat and so um that's going to have to be a staple for us we're going to have to stay out of our own way um we need taylor heineke to avoid batted balls okay those are just as as bad as you know it not it's not necessarily a, it's as bad as a penalty because you're not moving backwards but it's like a wasted play right it's a wasted down essentially so Got to steer clear of those, you know, get the ball in the hands of playmakers and allow them to do the heavy lifting. But I want to talk numbers with this Giants football team because this is a team that, you know, I talked about how often they blitz. They're one of the highest blitz rate and pressure teams percentage-wise in the league with their defensive coordinator, Wink Martindale. It's what they do. However, they don't produce a ton of sacks. Now, uh, you know, they've been missing some of their pass rushers. Aziz Ojolari, as I just mentioned, might be back this week. It looks like that's going to be the case. Huge uh, part of their, you know, ability to get to the quarterback. He led them in sacks a season ago. So um, that may change down the stretch. Who knows? 
However, they're 26th right now in the league in sacks. Like, they don't get a ton of sacks. So I would like to see us be able to protect Taylor Heineke and not have him be under siege. And that's not something the Giants really specialize in, in getting to the quarterback. So I'd like to see us be able to keep him upright, give him time to push the football down the field. They're going to come after him, as I've mentioned already. We better be prepared for the blitz. They better be prepared to either pick it up or have answers for it, to get it out of his hands quickly, because if they don't, they better have some blitz beaters, because if they don't, Heineke is going to be under siege and mistakes may happen. So they better be ready to offset the Giants' aggressiveness in blitzing, especially in obvious passing situations. Wink Martindale loves to dial them up. The Giants are tied for 28th in the league in interceptions. And the only reason they're not dead last, which is what they were going into the Thanksgiving game against Dallas, is because they got two up off of Dak Prescott in that game, or else they would have still been last in the league in that department. Okay, so they, they don't pick off a ton of passes. They don't create a lot of turnovers. They're right now tied for 14th in the league in turnovers that they forced on the season. And again, a lot of that stems from the turnovers they forced on Thanksgiving against Dallas. They forced two and, and a third if you want to add in the turnover on downs that they produced uh, early in that ball game. So that would make it a third if you want to count that one. But I don't think that actually goes into the statistics as a turnover. That said, um, they're not a high turnover rate team in terms of forcing them and producing them. So we need to take care of the football. I, I talk about this every week, staying clean not turning it over, and Heineke seems to be a guy that is just going to have to get one out of his system. Well, this is the week where he shouldn't have to do that. Don't get one out of your system. Don't turn it over. Don't fumble. Don't throw a pick. Take care of the rock. Protect the Duke, right? He's capable. He's done it before. He can do it again. And we haven't actually seen a game where he hasn't even been close to turning it over. Even the Houston game, the one game that he was cleaning, the only game that he was cleaning, he, he should have thrown a pick on the very first possession of the game. So I'd like to see him stay clean and not even be remotely close to throwing a pick this week. Anyway, I just wanted to mention those things. The Giants' rush defense is 23rd in the NFL. Now, they've had injuries. They've been without... Williams in the middle, Leonard Williams in the middle of that defense for a substantial amount of time this season. They've been shuffling guys in and out. They've dealt, dealt just like other teams have, they've dealt with injuries. But I said all that to say this, they can be run on. And, and a lot of the success that you can have against them is on the edges, on the perimeter. They're big and they're stout with Dexter Lawrence and Williams if he plays um, in the middle of that defense. It's going to be tough to run up the middle, right? They've got defensive tackles that can play. But you can get outside on them. You can run off tackle. You can run outside zone on them. You can force those big guys to have to motor and chug and run and wear them down. And that's what we've done during this winning streak, you know, you know, three straight and six out of seven, is we've worn teams down, especially the last three games in particular. So I'd like to see us test that 23rd overall rush defense. I'd like to see that defense be really pushed to the limit to the point where it then impacts their pass defense because they have to be more aggressive in stopping the run. And now with a young secondary, maybe you get Fabian Moreau back. Maybe you get, you know, some of the other guys, Darnay Holmes back. All right. Cordell Flott looks like he's going to play. I didn't even see him listed on the injury report. So they're going to get some of their guys back healthy in the secondary, but they're still going to be missing a Dory Jackson. So we'll see what, we're capable of doing, but I want to put pressure on that rush defense to the point where it impacts their pass off uh, defense. So we'll see if we can make that happen. Um, here's the thing that you got to know about the Giants defensively, and this is one of the most important stats. This is why they are seven and four right now. This is why they're dangerous is because you can move the football up and down the field. Okay. Against the Giants, but they stiffen when it matters most in the red zone. They have the fifth best red zone defense percentage-wise in terms of giving up touchdowns in the NFL, okay? And when you do that, you give yourself a chance because statistically, you can be getting destroyed and demolished. But you look up at the scoreboard 
and you've kicked four field goals and scored one touchdown and it's only 19 to 13 and somehow the Giants are still in the game even though you've outgamed them two to one. They only have three first downs in the game. You have eight. You've won time of possession to this point two to one. All right. But yet you look up and with eight minutes to go in the fourth quarter, they're only down six. They find ways to get stops when it matters the most. We haven't been great in the red zone this season. We're getting better, but we still got a long way to go. This game will be won in the two areas that I talk about all the time. Red zone efficiency, and that goes for both sides of the ball for us. Stopping the Giants when they get to the red zone and forcing them to settle for three. And scoring touchdowns when we get in the red zone against this Giants D. That's what this game's going to come down to. And the Giants are one of the best in the league at stopping the opposition from getting into the end zone. Hence the 7-4 and four mark at this point of the season. You want to know something else that they do extremely well? Second half points. I've talked to you about this already, right? I, I said the Giants are one. And, and I had no statistical knowledge of where they ranked. I was just going off the top of the dome thinking about all their games this season, all the comebacks that they've had, all the rallies, all the games that they've found a way to pull out late. Tennessee, Green Bay. And I thought about all the big numbers they put up in the second half, even some of the losses that they have. Big offensive outputs in the fourth quarter, third quarter to give themselves a chance. The only game where they really were asleep in the second half was Seattle. Maybe the Lions game as well. But this is a team that has been one of the best second half teams in the league. Right now, they're fourth in the NFL in average second half points. 12.6 points per second half for the Giants. Puts them fourth in the league, which means they're never out of the football game. We saw it in the Ravens game. They were down 13, and just like that, they were ahead in that game. A couple of mistakes by Lamar Jackson, take advantage of some turnovers, and boom, they take the lead. Just like that. We've seen them come back, rally, win games, hang around, steal games at the end. Titans game, great example, getting blanked at halftime, rally, score 21 unanswered, and win that, or excuse me, score 21 of the uh, final... 28 points in that game and win 21-20. Even if we jump on them early, we cannot take our foot off the gas pedal. And again, saying that is like me talking out of the side of my neck because when have we jumped on anybody and when have we ever had a chance to really put the proverbial foot on the gas pedal? Like, that's not what we do. And even when we are in those positions, we never, ever slam the door shut on a team. Minnesota, Houston even, Atlanta. I could go on and on. Green Bay, there's so many games where we had an opportunity, finally getting up two scores. Philadelphia, that first possession where you had a chance to score a touchdown and you settled for a field goal. Could have run it up, made it a 13-point lead, and instead, you didn't do it. This is going to be a big game for all the reasons we've already mentioned all week long. But the biggest thing here is that it's an NFC East game. It's a conference game. And it's a team just like you fighting for their proverbial playoff lives, right? They're fighting for their playoff life right now are the Giants. They feel it slipping away. And they're looking at Washington like food as an opportunity to get back right. They've had success against us and they think they're going to continue that success on Sunday. We're going to have to do the little things. It's the little things that make all the difference in this league. 
We can't have the stupid special teams penalties where the hidden yardage comes into play. We had one of those last week where you're starting a drive at the 10-yard line. You get, a, you get a great stop by the defense and a punt, and you field the punt at the 40, and you should be starting at your own 41-yard line, damn near at midfield, and instead you got a 10-yard penalty, and now you're all the way back at the you know 19-yard line starting a drive. That's 22 yards of hidden yardage that we won't talk about, but that's huge in a game like this where we know there will not be a ton of points scored. Neither one of these teams will be making a trip to the 30s. Hell, we can't even be assured that either one of these teams will make a trip to the 20s. Although I do think there will be a trip to the 20s by one of the two um, teams in this game. But we can't be assured of that, okay? We just know that this is going to be a physical football game. It may be a ball control game, just like last week against Atlanta, where both teams want to run the football. It ultimately, I think, is going to come down to the team that makes the least amount of mistakes and the team that takes advantage of the opportunities, whether they're given them by the opposition, the officials, or they create the opportunities, whatever the case may be. Whenever an opportunity presents itself, the team that takes advantage of it the most in this game is going to ultimately find themselves the victor. Which leads me to my prediction for this game. It, I, I'm going to be honest with you guys. All right? I, I, I usually don't divulge this stuff. I keep this to myself because I feel like it's my duty to do that in order to keep the good juju going. But I'm no longer scared. I feel like I've been in the closet. All right? And I feel like I've been hiding this for so long and I feel free now. I can actually come out and say this. Okay, there were times this year where I didn't pick us, even though I thought we were going to win out of superstition and being scared. Okay, scared of being let down again, scared of, you know, making a mistake that may alter the outcome of the game. I'm not super superstitious, but I am a bit superstitious. And so there were times this season, like the Bears game, for instance, I thought we were going to beat the Bears. But guess what? I felt like if I picked us to beat the Bears, we were going to lose. I picked us to beat the Titans and we lost. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick the opposition. And it worked. I picked us to lose against the Bears. We won. I picked us to lose against Indianapolis. We won. Uh, or I don't know if we, I picked us to lose that game or not. I picked us to lose the Philadelphia game. I thought we could win. I've been talking about it the whole week that this is a great matchup for us. I did everything short of predicting a victory. Why? Because in my mind, my twisted, warped mind, if I picked us to win, we were going to lose. I'm done with that. This team has instilled confidence in me. And no matter the outcome of this game, whether we win or lose, it's not going to change the way I feel about this team. This team is different. Mentally, physically, they're built for tough. And because of that, they've instilled a level of confidence in me that I haven't had since 2012. Thus... I think we're going to MetLife Stadium in front of a raucous Giants crowd who wants blood. They're out for blood this Sunday. They're going to have on their 1980s classic throwback blue uniforms that they wore earlier this season against the, the Chicago Bears. They'll be sporting those. They'll be feeling good. They'll be looking good. Those are some damn clean jerseys, okay? And they're gonna, they, they feel like they're going to come out and they're going to get this shit done. And we're going to go in there. We're going to shut shit down. We're going to shut down Saquon Barkley. Daniel Jones is going to have his moments, okay? But we're going to limit his explosiveness and, and his dangerous plays. They'll have one or two, you know, explosives and they'll score a couple of times and, and this thing will be nip and tuck. It'll be back and forth. But when it's all said and done, Washington will prevail in this game 23-17. to 17. Well, It won't be without a scare. What, what's a Washington Commanders game without a damn near heart attack? The Giants will have the football late in this game, down 23-17, to 17, with a chance to drive it the length of the field and win. And just like last week, we will preserve the victory on defense. I hope it doesn't come down to that but that's the way I see it transpiring in my head. Anyway, what says you? 
score and more leave it down in the comment section two touchdowns three um nfc conference or nfc player uh special teams player of the month uh joey sly field goals to go along with two touchdowns one passing one rushing and Washington prevails 23-17 to 17 to make it a four-game win streak, 8-5 and five on the season, heading into their bye week, playing their best football of the season. Leave it down in the comment section. How does this game end up? I've already got fans telling me we're definitely losing this game. We're definitely losing to the Giants. You saw what Mariota and that offense did to us. The, the Giants are going to copy it and do it even better. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. That's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T. Enjoy your weekend. You know I will. We'll reconvene on Sunday. If you're a member of the MOBB, we will be watching that game, sitting on pins and needles live together. All right? We ride together. We die together. We the mob for life. For the rest of you, I will see you at the conclusion of Giants Commanders. Win, lose, or draw, you know where to find me, your man, Louis T. Until then, you guys, have a good one. And don't forget, I'll leave the link to that Ron Rivera interview with the 33rd team in the comment section. I will pin that comment at the top. See you next time. Here comes the diesel. Here comes the diesel. There's the snap. Hand to Riggins. Good hole. He's got the first.